You are listening to the Anxiety Podcast, where we support you to overcome anxiety and reduce stress. We will get vulnerable and it will be real. Here's your host, Tim J.P. Collins. Yes, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Um, I'm glad you're here. Welcome back. Before I get on to this week's interview, I wanted to tell you a little bit about the inner circle, the less anxiety, more life inner circle. So this is a group I've been putting together. Um, It's basically a group of motivated individuals that are wanting to overcome anxiety and live a big life, as I talk about. The inner circle is essentially um, group coaching, amongst other things. Um, I, I you know, throw group coaching in there. I have dedicated email support, um, access to documents that I use with one-on-one coaching clients. Um, we have a private group. I put videos out on a regular basis. There is accountability, support, um, there's some guided meditations thrown in. And uh, essentially, it's a place for you to get a bit more involved, um, a little bit more involved with um, overcoming your anxiety. Maybe you'd, you'd you're not ready to step into full one-on-one coaching. Maybe you can't afford it. And maybe you just prefer a group setting. You know, some people just like listening to what other people have to say. You don't necessarily have to speak up. You can submit questions via email. And once a month, we're going to be doing a live call, which will be 60 plus minutes long um, with me. So you'll be able to ask me your questions directly, listen to other people. And if you're anything like me, um, some of my biggest breakthroughs have, have come through listening to what other people have to say. So there's a huge amount of power in, in the group setting. Um, and I've priced this offer so that it's available for everybody. It's not a, an exclusive thing. Um, I've made it really affordable on purpose. So lots of people will be able to participate. And the more people in the group, the more good stuff we'll be able to talk about and uh, the more help we'll be able to get out there. So it's $9.97 a month. So you can, uh, as I put on the, the website, you can either go and buy a fancy coffee or you can go join our group and overcome anxiety. So that's the inner circle. Yeah, so to sign up, just go to the usual place, theanxietypodcast.com. And uh, you'll see at the top of the page, there'll be a tab which says inner circle. Click that and it'll give you a lot of the details I just talked about. Um, and that's where you can just click a little button which says join now and you can join the club. And be part of our gang. Um, We'd like to see you in there. So without further ado, we will get on to the show. Today we're talking about PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and and how this brave lady overcame that, and uh, and now what she's doing to give back to others. So here we go, on to the show. Okay, so today on the podcast I have Sheila Kay, and uh, Sheila is a retired immigration paralegal. Uh, she's a writer, an editor, a ghost writer for the past 10 years, and that includes a wide variety of novels, academic writing, and magazine writing and editing. Um, and she's also co-founder of the up-and-coming nonprofit organization, which provides job skills, training, and resources to homeless to the homeless in Atlanta um, who wish to return to the workforce. So that's a lot. You've got a lot going on, Sheila. Um, welcome to the Anxiety Podcast. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. So what I often do is kind of um, for for the listeners to to kind of get to know you a bit, maybe you could give us a bit of your your own kind of personal background. Maybe you want to expand on some of the the bio stuff a bit more. Um, And then you can kind of obviously go on to the the story around how anxiety showed up in your life. Um, And then we can kind of work forwards from there to, to talk a bit about the book you've written and what you're up to current day. Does that sound all right? Certainly. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan, and moved to the Atlanta area about nine years ago. Uh, from my personal life, I have two adult daughters and one granddaughter that I don't spoil in the least. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> my book, uh, PTSD and the Undefeated Me, is based upon a story uh, in my life, as you said, a tragedy that ha- happened to me a little less than five years ago. And coming out of post-traumatic stress syndrome, I decided to put into writing those issues that I thought would be relevant for people with that and other mental health conditions, including severe anxiety. 
It's my uh, what what happened is that my husband contracted uh, a condition known as toxic epidermal necrolysis ten. It's called, and what it does, it's an adverse reaction to prescription medication that sheds the skin. The body totally rejects the skin. Mm. In my case, this happened within a 13-day period. My husband went from healthy and died 13 days later. And as his caregiver and next, as his next of kin, um, I was there naturally. He, he saw it all, sight, sounds, all of that. And what I did was suppress what I was seeing in order. In my mind, I thought I did not want my husband to know what was going on with him. So, so I continued to visit him, care for him and all that without really processing what I was seeing. Eventually, I, I went on, went back to my normal activities and sold the house, did those type of things. And about three to four months later, I started exhibiting. Well, actually, I had these same symptoms through the summer that it happened. but intense uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, anxiety, disturbing behaviors I started having, which at first I denied and said was, oh, this is normal grief. And as things got worse, there was an incident that led me to know that I needed to seek help and that I had a problem beyond grief. Yeah. For the first uh, year or so, uh, I did seek therapy and did the things that uh, the therapist told me. For me, uh, I'm at the point I am today because of com a combination of things, including medical help, um, my own faith, belief, uh, and especially the support system of friends and family. With that combination, with that team, so to speak, I was able to eventually get to the point where first I faced what it was that I'm somewhere beyond grief and, and missing my husband. I'm not that superhuman person that can go through what I've gone through and say, okay, I'm going to just dust myself off and mm -hmm. keep going. For me, that was a pivotal moment and one of the most difficult, one of the most difficult because I am the type of person, which a lot of people are, that, oh, I'm the nurturer in the family. I'm the strong one in the family. You know, something can't be wrong with me, let alone the stigma of me, mental illness. So that was the first step toward getting to where I am now and beyond, was to recognize and accept that something was very much wrong with me. Yeah. And do you think that, um, you know, the PTSD was uh, kind of especially difficult because you were, as you said, you were kind of being the nurturing one and holding it together? Um, whilst your husband was suffering? I do. I, I can go even further back from my experience, and this is my experience. I do believe that even from childhood, being a very shy, painfully shy and sensitive child and not having the worst upbringing, but certainly some, some difficulties there, I believe that in my case, what happened may have hit me stronger than, say, an, another type of mm. child. And as you say, going forward and going through my life, I've always been the rock, quote unquote, rock in the family. I've always been the one that people came to. So what made it harder for me was that I was in a place of vulnerability, which I was not used to, nor mm -hmm. did I like. So I fought that. I fought, I fought that. And that exacerbated the symptoms I was having, too. I believe in hindsight that yeah. that's the case. And at what point did you say enough is enough? Um, I can't be the rock anymore. I got to kind of take care of myself. When things got so bad that I attempted suicide a couple mm -hmm. of times and I had ideations of that, I was just focused on that. I could not function. And as I say, deep down, despite my trauma, I'm this, in my eyes, strong woman, independent woman. And I couldn't function. I couldn't do the normal things that I was used to doing. And on some level, looking back now, I think I sort of got tired of that. I sort of got tired of being, to me, PTSD and all of the symptoms had me victim. They held me hostage. They, they, they held on to me. And I wanted to sh shake that off, but I, for years, couldn't find a way out of, out of the mm -hmm. darkness. And so, um, one of the things I remember you saying last time we spoke was, um, about the fact that, 
it's a bit of a an invisible illness so you found yourself kind of you know you'd be out doing the groceries or something like that and people would probably think that everything was fine by looking at you but internally you were you know churning up absolutely this type of mental illness as well as anxiety it is so dangerous and sad to some extent because it is invisible to look at me even today and even right after these events occurred was to see you know maybe she's shy or maybe she's not friendly or maybe she's this it's until a person like me goes into a crisis situation which i have done several times i've uh, left as you say places where i'm conducting business grocery carts left in the middle of the store prescriptions left, left on the shelf of the pharmacy because i could feel crisis coming on and you know i've been in a market and just everything just hit i'm dressed well i'm speaking well i'm friendly i'm i have on the mm-hmm. facade so i think and something just broke me and I found myself sitting in the middle of the grocery store, just openly just weeping and weeping. So, yes, it, it hides itself. It hides itself to the extent that even my closest relatives will say now, oh, we did not realize you were thinking or feeling those things at the family barbecue or at the, the party for the babies or whatever. They they apologize my sister in particular when she as close as we are could not see it so certainly you know other people like me the the world at large cannot see they walk up we walk among you i think that's the post i put in facebook not long ago we walk right among you and should have a voice but i think even at the worst of my time if even if someone were to approach me to speak on it at that time i couldn't even if I were, if someone saw it and asked, I was in that much pain and, and so fearful of people. My anxiety had risen to the level of I wouldn't sleep because I was all through the night. Someone's going to break in the house. I'm up and down the stairs, checking windows, checking doors, fearful of the mailman, fear, fearful of the utility people, just that, that high level of anxiety. So I think at its worst, even if I were visible, so to speak, I don't think I would have been able to com- communicate. Certainly not, not like mm. I am now. Yeah, and I think that you know, being you're kind of on high alert for everything um, on some level when when that happens. But yeah, I, I get what you're saying about you know the the invisible part because when I came out um, with my anxiety <laughs> and and uh, everything that was going on for me, I got a lot of messages. Uh, from people very close to me and people not so close to me saying, oh, I never would have known. Like, you you, uh, you know, because I was doing, I was working 24-7 to create the illusion that everything was okay. Um, yeah. Even though, strangely, uh, even though that's kind of detrimental to our rehabilitation in some respects, because until we really own up to it, it's just going to take longer, right? We're just uh, yeah. extending yeah. the duration of it. Exactly, or making it worse in some cases. Uh, on your point, uh, about a week ago, I came across a lady who reached out on Facebook and was telling me that she was having some symptoms and she wasn't sure. Anyway, it led to the creation by a fellow author of a Facebook group just motivating women. It wasn't PTSD related. It wasn't mental illness related, just for women to inspire and communicate with one another. I tell you, within two hours that she created the page, there were no less than 15 women who were writing, based on my post, were writing that they had either PTSD, anxiety, they had gone through this, social anxiety, all types of uh, problems that they had had. And so many of them felt, well, this is a safe place. For me to say this, I have a Facebook page. I am an author, or I am this, that, or the other. But they don't know mm-hmm. that, and so they were surprised that they, meaning the, the people they do business with, or the people that buy their books, say it's a fiction book. You know, there's no reason to say in that fiction book what I am mm-hmm. saying. But it was so interesting that they started, as you put it, coming out. In that short period of time, and I think now I count it, there's about 50 women of the 400 that are there that have some type of mental illness that they're either dealing with or ignoring, which I encourage you not to do. 
um, ignoring or trying to push past. Yeah, and I think, uh, again, as the last time I spoke to you, it just makes me think about how many people are probably out there suffering in the world, whether it's anxiety or depression or something else, um, and hiding it because our, 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 our natural human response, because we continue to want to be accepted by people and loved by people, is that we should just hide it, right? Like any deficiency or any abnormality should be hidden and, and not seen. And, and that puts huge amount of pressure on us as the sufferer, um, but also kind of blocks out any potential help. Um, so yeah, it just makes me, th- well, when you're talking there, it just makes me think like as people, we just should be a lot more sensitive to other people around us and, and be careful how you treat people because you don't, you don't know what's going on behind the mask. Right. You absolutely do not know what is going on behind the mask. In my case, it's so strange because I hid behind clothes and jewelry, makeup, things like that. To me, the better I look, then mm. I'm okay. And those are the things in those early days that got me out of the door. I'm looking the best I can be, and so I'm okay. And that helped to kind of, like you said, for people not to see me or see something is wrong. Well, I'm not going to go out of the house, me or anybody else, going to go out of the house, you know, looking deranged and all of that. So most of the times, and this is what I told my doctors, most of the time you see me the most dressed up I'm feeling the worst (laughs) because I'm trying to offset what I'm feeling so if you have other people like me who do that even more they're even more invisible yeah they're they're hiding behind that like the when you look the when you look the best then you're actually struggling the most because yeah I mean again it goes back to you know this we want people to superficially look at us and think that we're good you know yeah and we're not even aware of that level. I mean, nobody wants to admit what people think of them matters. But I agree with you that, yeah, it does. It does, especially the stigma of mental illness. Uh, I know I'm probably much older than you, but I know years and years ago, you know, they put you for what I went through. They put you in a back room. And, and close the door and feed you three times a day, you wouldn't come out, you know, for fear of embarrassing mm. your family. So there's this stigma of any type of mental illness, and ours is even more unfortunate because the stigma is still there, and the resources, with the exception of military, are more scarce than they should be. And that's part of the reason I speak on this. I get so much support from veterans and their families that have PTSD or know somebody with PTSD. And now the civilian population are starting to talk to me more. Certainly they've been out there years before I have, but just to know there's, I'm doing that little part to, to promote awareness that there are civilians. Could be your neighbor, could be your daughter, could be anybody that has not seen combat what they are experiencing, the flashbacks and the anxiety and the severe depression and all of those things that all go along with it for one reason or another. Mm. Not everybody was as fortunate as I also in having uh, insur- the insurance, the health insurance and the things that I needed to. So that's, that's part of the, the whole promotion of this is to say, you know, let's get some funds together for those who don't have the resources to get help. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, you know, just to, just to kind of go back to your previous point about you getting dressed up when you're feeling at your worst, it, it kind of makes me think about when you're at your most relaxed, right? When you don't care what anybody thinks, you could probably go to the supermarket in your pajamas if you were totally at peace with the world and didn't care what anybody thought um, or what anybody thought of you. But um, but yeah, I, that, that, that makes a lot of sense to me for sure. Yeah, you know, me personally, I am a girly girl, so I wouldn't exactly jump her. But I would, yeah, I'd, I'd be a lot more relaxed. My posture would be more relaxed. My mind, yeah, to just go and not you know, have have to feel I have to do that to go. And I've gotten a lot better. Yeah. So in terms of um, kind of when you started uh, your recovery, shall we say, when you kind of said, you know, enough's enough and you, you wanted to to work on getting better. What did that look like for you? What did you begin to do? 
ex- the first thing was to accept. Because when I tell you for at least two years, regardless of what anybody said or what I did, I refused to accept it. Even when I believed it, I wouldn't accept it within myself. So it felt like turning a mirror. It felt like I'm going to look at this, whatever I see, I'm going to look at this and I'm coming out of this, whatever it takes to do, however long it takes, I cannot live like this. I can't survive like this. So it was a huge feeling of acceptance and and, and a measure of release when I finally did accept it, but even that phase and that stage was very challenging. But I knew I was going forward. Right. So it felt like a little push in my back, just a little, just yeah. a little nudge in my back. Yeah. And when you say uh, the acceptance part was for you, was that accepting that your husband was gone, or just accepting your PTSD situation? Well, I, I'm sure you can imagine the the loss. And, and all that goes with that when you lose someone that close mm-hmm. to you. So there was that, and then there was the other side of it, or in addition to the, the grief and the loss, there was accepting the loss, and then there was accepting that with this loss and with this grief, I'm carrying this additional burden. When I wanted to believe on some level, I lost my husband, it was bad and all of that, but I'm okay. That's, that was my preference. I'd rather say, okay, I'm just grieving. I'm just grieving that and accepting, yes, you're grieving, but this goes beyond the grief, if yeah. that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. So, and then, so as that acceptance began, were the practical things that you began to do on a daily basis in terms of things you would think about or things that you would do that would that you feel would be beneficial to share with other people? Yes. Yes, there were. Uh, among other things, the, the way I uh, thought. Now, that took effort, but I tell you, that was the most helpful for me in terms of my mind is to make the concerted effort with everything within me to turn my thinking because as with PTSD and anxiety and others, your, your mind, you can open your eyes and your, your mind goes to the left, to the negative first. And in my case, it would stay there if I didn't let it. So for, for that period of time, I, you know, felt negative, thought negative, thought on, I would turn my mind. So as you say, practical and in, in practical theory, I thought, if I could find a way to hook on to that thought and say, okay, yeah, thought, you're here, but I'm going to turn the page. I'm going to change the channel. That is something I do to this mm. day. Pull myself away mentally from whatever is unpleasant, from whatever is negative, the flashbacks, the, all of these things, and do that. That, for me, after the acceptance was my first step, was getting help learning how to, how to do that. I was not encouraged from childhood to really shoot for the positive, shoot for the positive. I was more or less encouraged to see the negative things and to be a negative type of person. And I had been fighting that negativity prior to the trauma. When this happened, that negativity was so intense that I had to turn away from it. And only until I started learning to turn away from it could I take the additional steps which included reaching out to others. That has been so beneficial for me, reaching out to other people, taking, taking myself out of myself. Just reach out to somebody else, large or small, whoever it is, and that, that helps. That's too, I can think of offhand. Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, was your negative programming, you think, just something that you grew up with? I did, yes, grow up with negative programming, but nowhere near to the extent that I had after right. this happened. So, yes, in, in large measure, uh, I saw the world, let's say gray, not black, but gray, in shades mm. of gray. So there was some anxiety, uh, I believe, even even as a child that I had some measure of anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? Cause now when I speak to you, you come across as a very 
gentle, you know, graceful, peaceful, loving person. Very positive, in fact. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so maybe kind of talk us through the, the recovery a bit for you. So you, you you started turning your thoughts to obviously turning a page, as you said, and, and uh, it seems like a recurring theme with whether it's PTSD or anxiety, but we first kind of have to accept that it's going to be with us before we can move ahead. Um, and I was just literally having a conversation with somebody today about the same thing, which is we're not necessarily saying it's going to be gone forever. We're just saying, you know, it's, it's now part of us, but we're going to live on in spite of it and, you know, just move past it essentially. Yeah. Um, so in addition to that, what, what else did you do? Do you think in, as you started kind of feeling better and, and recovering? I started talking about it, uh, yeah. more. My, my viewpoint was as the nurturer and, and the rock, um, I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want them to know. And of course they were with me through the whole ordeal, but they could not imagine you know, what was going on in my head or some of the things I saw. So I started talking about it. And that little by little, you know, I didn't give all the gory details, but I, little by little what that did was two things. It helped my family to understand what I was going through more, and it relieved some of the pressure cooker mm -hmm. in my mind. So that helped quite a bit once I, once I started talking about it. Now, I, I believe even since the book, and it took about a year or more to write the book, now that pressure is even less because I've reached beyond my borders and I'm reaching out to people all over the world now and talking about it. So I can say that talking about it, whether on the small scale, because at first you, you can't, you, you, you don't, you don't want to, you know, then on the scale that I'm doing it now and hope to in the future, that it's, it's a two-fold benefit to the recipient and the gift. Yeah, yeah I think that's a, an important thing is that, I mean, certainly for me and, and other people I know who've suffered with different things is, you know, the, the ability to give back or to share the story, um, to support other people who may be having issues today, um, I think is one of the, the blessings that comes out of it. Um, one of the big upsides and then it allows you to connect with people on a level which wouldn't have been possible previously. For me, it's a, it's a relief to know that I'm not alone. Of course I knew there were other people that were suffering from a variety of things, but I never knew that there were so many that are suffering and are silent or that are suffering and are getting treatment, are getting help, are getting better, but they refuse to share that. So for me, it helped knowing that those God awful days and nights, I was not alone, that there were someone, a lot of someone who were going through the same thing and that now certainly I'm not at all alone. I, as a matter of fact, I'm in very good company. There are people like you and I you know, doing marvelous things in spite of, or, or because yeah. of, because of what we've gone through. So what would you say to, to somebody who's in, in the midst of it right now? I would first strongly recommend, depending on the symptoms that a person is having, that they not second guess what those symptoms are. Get, get some sort of help immediately, which could mean even just opening up and telling someone, hey, I'm doing this. I would never recommend anyone to do what I did, which is try to hide and you know, put on this facade that I'm strong, that can, that can lead to some really awful consequences. So I would suggest that that person immediately get help, even if help means picking up a phone or rolling over to someone and saying, hey, I don't feel good. I don't feel very good. I don't feel well at all. That would, for me would be the first thing. Uh, the symptoms, as you probably know, could include depression that you can't come out of that no matter what you do, you can't, you can't come out of the sadness or depression. You have thoughts 
of hurting yourself or someone else. You're in a darkness that no one can see. Flashbacks of whatever the event was that you cannot, not, and not just memories, but actually reliving whatever the trauma was. It, it, I would just say if you sense any of that, just to talk to someone first and from there, whatever your path may be, mine, you know, will may be different from someone else with the same condition. For me, as I said, when we first started talking, for me, it was a combination of things that brought me to this point in my healing, but for whatever path that person is taking, the first one has to be to tell someone yeah. else. Yeah, I think for sure, locking it up inside is, uh, is as you said, there's a kind of the pressure cooker or, you know, that amount of pressure building up needs to be released. Like it needs to, you need to get some of it out of you. And the, the fear on the, on the back of that, the fear that you have, if it's possible, try to know, no matter what it is, that someone else is, is going through the same thing. Try to fight that isolation that PTSD has a tendency to lock you up inside of an isolation with a feeling of, you know, nobody else is feeling this. Uh, paranoid thoughts, you know, they're going to do this, they're going to do that. Try to say, as I, I, I posted today, try to say, I am going to survive and love myself and take care of myself and be true to myself because I am the most valuable possession that I have. I ha so if you ha don't have yourself, if you don't have you in your right mind, walking toward healthiness, helping others, if you don't have yourself, you can't accomplish anything. Mm -hmm. You're just there. It's darkness. So love on yourself. Love on your mind, whatever it's thinking. Love on your body, whatever it's feeling. Love on it. And eventually, acceptance will come and help in healing, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, some very wise words there. Um, so in terms of your kind of what you're doing moving forward, you've obviously got a book. Um, the you know, Do you want to tell us a bit more about any of the specific parts in there that you think would be relevant for people? Certainly, PTSD and the Undefeated Me is a memoir actually and it chronicles my journey it, it, it speaks of course on the, the trauma the, and then goes back actually from my childhood to present day and a lot of the book of course I include at the end PTSD information and resources but throughout the book I give what I believe is a unique perspective in that I speak in first person as though it is happening now present tense so the reader is actually walking with me. My idea behind that was to say, you know, come on with me, hold my hand, let's go through this, and somewhere in one of these pages you'll find a similarity. And in finding that similarity, you'll walk your own path toward wholeness and healing. I speak about my observations during the worst of my PTSD. I think it's helpful for people to know, well, what what is that person thinking? I have a friend or I have a relative with PTSD, what were they thinking? What was that face about when, when I said this or that or the other? So I say, you know, in, in my voice, th this is what I was thinking when the doctor said this or someone else mm -hmm. said this or that. Then I go up through thoughts that I've been thinking, I won't say after the PTSD, but after I'm much, much better presently, thoughts that I think now, ob observations I've made since I've written the book, observations I made just before I made, uh, wrote the book. And they're practical uh, observations, suggestions, things that people can relate to. It was important that the book be relatable not to just people with PTSD, but caregivers, family members, uh, natural disaster survivors, whoever might even have an opportunity to come close to, to PTSD, anxiety, depression, those type of things. What what was I thinking when I encountered this or that? Or what did I observe just from looking at something in nature? How did that whole wholeness run through my body when I saw something so beautiful? Things like that. I kind of befriend or I attempt to befriend whoever's reading the book 
not to uh, convince them one way or the other, but to let them find familiarity in those words and then apply them, even if it's just one word in the book, apply them toward their own goals or toward their own healing. Yeah. I think that's huge because a lot of people I speak to, um, it's it's very reassuring for them to know that other people can resonate with the story or the issue or you know how they're currently feeling. Um, and, and I think, as you said, whether it's anxiety or PTSD, when you're feeling it, you tend to think like you're the first person who's ever had it because it's so intense yeah. and it's all about you and it's very internal. And um, you know that's why a lot of us anxiety sufferers will question whether we're dying or question whether it's a heart attack or something, you know, super bad because the feelings just take you there. They, they make you think that something, you know, terrible is happening. They do. They absolutely do. And in your reality, if, if, it's, if those thoughts are uncontested, it is happening. And I know you can relate to that. It absolutely is happening. If, if you are not fighting against that, it becomes your reality. If not right then, eventually. And that was my fear, that eventually I would totally shut down and see the world through my quote-unquote PTSD mm. eyes, not through Sheila's real reality, which I'm living now. Absolutely. So in terms of, uh, I'm interested in... Th- kind of anything else that you you want to add in terms of uh because it, mentally it sounds like you've really you've really switched and you've really shifted gears is there anything that you kind of do to nurture yourself on a on a daily weekly basis um to to make sure that you're kind of putting yourself first I do I'm uh as I said I'm a girly girl so I make sure that paint your nails and stuff <laughs> Definitely having right, them painted. Okay. Thank you. Nice. <laughs> uh, yes, making sure I uh, do that. Um, I try to the extent possible to take care of my health. Uh, walking, trying to eat, <laughs> trying to eat right, things like that to take care of my physical health to the extent I can. I spend a lot of time with people that I know love me and that are on Team Sheila. Because even with those people, I had shut away or, or, you know, saw people as little as possible. So I make sure I spend time with somebody that I know has my best interests at heart. And that, for me, means maybe not a lot of people, but it's a support, a strong support system. And that helps a lot. So I make sure I plan things to do with them. For me, personally, yes, I take time. I, I read a lot besides the writing and the other things I'm doing, I make sure I read. Sometimes I do what I call junk read, and I'll read a gossip magazine or something totally yeah. deep, you know, <laughs> yeah, just to lighten up. And so I'll soak in the tub and I'll read something that's not related to our subject matter. I'll read something funny. I, I, I do entertainment that I enjoy. I enjoy comedians and things like that. I make sure I go out and do those things. Yeah, and those are... Uh... All good. I mean, I don't read girly magazines or get my nails done too often these days. But um, <laughs> uh, but no, I think you know it's important. To, and I think one of the other things for many people that comes out of out of these types of things is that we we learn to take better care of ourselves. Um, because it sounds like you, as a you know, as a devoted wife and mom and stuff, that you've been probably spending a lot of your life um, supporting other people. Um, and a lot of your life, you know, taking care of, taking care of everybody else at your expense. Mm-hmm. Um, That's yeah. Very so now it's, uh, it's great that you can kind of put yourself first in a lot of ways. And, um, you know, in order to be useful to other people, we have to take care of ourselves first. That is so true. I, it took me a while and I still haven't perfected it, but yes, to be selfish enough. Uh, where I feel like this is this or that is something for me and only me. You're right on point that, especially as a mother, you you, you don't do that very often. Even when your children are adults, as mine are, you don't do that very often. So that took yeah. practice. And each of the things that I'm saying is not you know turn the light on and Sheila mastered this or that. I still haven't 
mastered them. I can only say I'm confident that I'm so much better than before. But each of these suggestions and my observations, they take work. They took work to begin them and they take work to maintain them. There are weeks when I would just know, you know, I'm going to stay in. I still, I don't want to, I don't want to do this or that or I don't want to, maybe I should, you know, do this, help, help, as you say, help my daughter do this instead of this time I had mapped out for myself. And then I say, no, you know, which one would benefit you better? And I'm confident that I know my family loves me and they support me. And so if there's something I have to say no to, it's still rare, but not quite as rare as it used to be. Yeah. And, uh, and in terms of the the rest of the family, do you th- I mean, I'm, is it how has it affected the relationship with your with your kids? How has well, just that, I mean, now you're kind of like a you know inspiring people and you, your book and all that kind of stuff. Is it uh, how does it how does it make them kind of look at you in terms of the work you're doing and stuff like that? Yes, I, I wasn't sure if you meant the, the tragedy, but what it has done is amazing because my daughters have the same I have two adult daughters and they both have the same sort of mindset as me being young though as as you know being young though sometimes you don't reach your goals and you don't do the things that you want to do fast yeah. enough and I think what it has shown them is that there is no age limit there are there are no obstacles as far as age or illness or anything to do what it is you want to do but that doesn't mean it's easy and so to me it's important to me that I see them uh, learning by example that their mom can do this they are <laughs> such encouragers and keep me laughing and not taking myself too seriously <laughs> so they have uh, they have seen and I leave this for my granddaughter as a legacy they have seen that you can overcome tremendous obstacles and not just, okay, I'm still living, but I'm still giving. Mm. Yeah, that's a, that is a powerful message. Yeah. I mean, I just, I, I, um, you inspire me. I think you show huge courage with what you've achieved and what you've done. And, you know, I'm no doubt your family's massively proud because, uh, there's they no other way that you could be, right? Absolutely. They, they are proud and supportive as well because I still need that, that support. I still need to know that they're there because every day still is not the best of days yeah. for me. And in those days, they've learned to get to, because I spoke up and told them some of the things I was going through. They give me wide berth on those days when no, you know, mom can't handle this plus that and another and then have some time for herself. And they give me that and try not to crowd me and show me the love and, and support. As I say, it's not very many people. There are my sister and her family and there are some, but they're 100% supportive and, and proud. And that's the win that has helped me rise above all this and helped me to say I'm going to not only write this book, but I'm going to have it published and I'm going to spread the word. They are a big part of it. They Mm -hmm. really are. That's a beautiful thing. Um, It is. So what do you see? um, Obviously, you've got the the book out there. I just wanted to, to ask kind of what else do you, do you have any other plans in your future in terms of Getting the word out or supporting people or um, you've obviously got the Facebook page there as well, which we can, we'll provide details of, but what else do you have up your sleeve for uh, inspiring people even more? Yeah, this thing sort of took off because I had, Tim, I had all lined up my next book and it's going to be fixed and it, it, it will happen, but this book took off in a direction I wasn't expecting. I've always been a source of inspiration and encouragement. I think that that's just inherent to my nature, but I never went beyond, again, here we go, these borders, which in my case, of course, is family, friends, at one time, church members, things like that. This thing has taken off to the degree that I believe my plan is to 
use this, this experience sure to, to inspire to speak I plan to start speaking uh, I think a couple of churches and uh, a veterans association or something that have contacted me regarding speaking so this is going to take more of my time than the second book because I do feel this is just that important where wherever I can get it you know if I stand on the street corner and say hey you know we need some help for people who are suffering we need help in the form of understanding my entire message which we talked about so in my future I do see that I will be speaking I'll be making speaking engagements I will be uh, giving interviews and whatever it takes to get the word out this Facebook thing I still haven't mastered my daughter actually is my administrator on the page but it, it has it has reached a lot of hearts and that's inspired me to take a different direction not just okay now I'm going to go on to fiction now my story is out it was cathartic and and I'm okay no I don't see that at all anymore I see that this will probably be my life's mm. work in form or not yeah because uh, and you know it seems like ultimately because it's it's kind of created a life of its own now and it's not about just Sheila anymore, it's about everybody else. That is exactly right, yes. Yes, it's, uh, it's mothers, daughters, certainly, you know, veterans, families of veterans. It's, you know, from the little girl, PTSD, as you know, it can come mm-hmm. from anything, from abuse or seeing abuse or seeing violence. So it's those little boys and girls that stand in the corner crying while their parents are fighting. It's, you know, the presidents of, of corporations who, you know, have witnessed someone else being killed or some other trauma that they can, it's universal. It transcends race, age. It transcends, transcends location. And that's pretty huge. That's pretty huge, but I think one little Detroit girl at a time who gives their story openly and freely, slowly but surely, that there'll be even more change than there has been. I'm honored to be among those that are already doing what I'm just starting to do. Absolutely. And you're doing a very good job of it. I mean, you, you know, you're sharing openly and, you know, that's going to resonate with people in a huge way. I have no doubt. I believe it. it. So, um, how can people uh, get in touch with you, Sheila, if they have questions or if they want to get hold of the book or talk to you on Facebook and stuff like that? What's the best way? Uh, My Facebook page is facebook.com author Sheila K. Yep. And my email address is Sheila K. Writer dot com yeah there's information on the facebook page of how to get the book but to get everything that you need as far as you know different resources to find this book i think the publisher page which is aristocrat publishing dot com would be the best place to go to find information would yeah, and obviously I'll, all these links and stuff that you're speaking of, I'll put them in the on the show notes for the podcast episode so people can just go and click and yeah. buy your book or comment on Facebook and that kind of stuff to be able to get in touch with you. Yeah. I think even some of your listeners might even enjoy a, a preview of the book. It, it starts off pretty powerful and could be of help. And that can be found on Amazon.com. Just type in the name of the book and there's a preview there, a free preview people to uh, gain whatever they can from that and they're free to read that yeah is there any anything else you want to say Sheila any kind of parting parting comments or things like that that you want to leave people with I certainly hope that your listeners can take whichever one of my words would bring positivity into their life and healing into their life or somebody that they love to to take one, I, I, like a recipe, you make make my story your own recipe. And in that recipe, just be sure to include loving on yourself and knowing and accepting not only that you have a problem, but that that problem is not going 
to break you completely that it is possible to move forward at your own pace and in your own way but get that momentum going whatever it takes mm-hmm. thank you sheila so much for taking the time to come on and um share your story again and huge courage from you and you know i, I can feel it and i'm sure other people will as well thank you so much Tim, yeah. for having me. okay we'll talk again soon as you heard, Sheila's a brave lady and um, she's, she's living life anyway. She's getting on with it and uh, I really admire that about her. So I hope you, uh, you know, related to today's conversation and, and certainly found that useful. As I talked about at the top of the show, don't forget to check out the uh, Inner Circle um, and some of the details that are included in that would be good to see you in there. Um, also ratings and reviews we still love them so uh, you'll be able to see in the show notes a place where you can rate and review the show and uh, yeah just remember until next time less anxiety more life thank you for listening to the anxiety podcast for more information go to the anxietypodcast.com